Hello and welcome to chapter 14, Mining Colony. If you remember last week, we uh, went to the dance and which the theme was Deadly Bites and um, they loved all the group dancing, all the old dancing and uh, they were had an accident with some deadly drinks all of which turned out okay and so now they are finished with that and we are ready to continue our story so chapter 14 mining colony everyone agreed our dance night was over and it was time to head back amaya offered to fly with sandy as she still couldn't run in her dress mm stripped out of his hazmat suit and offered to carry me i told balaji to save his magic and i accepted mr muscles picked me up and I snuggled down for a lovely, manly ride all the way back to the suite. I decided this was the way to travel from now on. When I got home, I was going to have Tyler go shirtless and carry me everywhere. I would caress his muscles while running my fingers through his hair. I'd probably kiss him too. I snapped back to reality to realize I was running my fingers through Mr. Muscle's hair and caressing him a little inappropriately. I quickly put a pin in my fantasy, I could fully explore that later, and lightly placed my hands on Mr. Muscle's shoulders in, in order to keep my hands to myself. Sorry, I said guiltily. It's alright, he said. Then he joked. I'm hard to resist. That's for sure, I smiled at him. Then I poked his solid chest. And you are hard. He just laughed and kept running. Thank goodness he had a sense of humor. I really needed to keep my Tyler fantasies he's on a leash. Before I knew it, we were back at our black and white suite, or, or blue and white suite, and the next part of the night was set to get started. Our sitting room was crowded with four humans and three centaur llamas, and it got even more crowded when the captain and another centaur walked through the fireplace. Who is that? I asked the captain. I'm a representative of the council, the Lama interjected. I'm here on official b capacity to record the events of tonight's activities and make sure everything is in order. Something about the way he said that was mildly interesting, mildly irritating. It was like he was here to make sure the kids didn't do anything stupid, although he probably thought they would. I looked at the captain, but she just gave me a resigned shrug. You are welcome to remain as long as you don't get in the way, I told him evenly. I could tell that phrasing didn't sit right with him, but I didn't care. I went to my bedroom and changed out of my fancy costume. CL, de-wrinkled and de-cat-haired everything and then stored it away properly. My leg looked better, although it was still a mass of blue and green. I slipped into comfortable sweatpants and a t-shirt and went back to the sitting room again. Balaji was on a was on a couch with Amaya, and I settled in beside them for a moment. I took a moment to close my eyes, center myself, and just breathe. This was an important night. I needed to be at my best. I felt the tension I'd been holding all day slip away when a sudden heaviness seeped into the room. I knew that feeling. It was the all rune, and I was glad it was here. I sent a burst of happiness out through my magic. Welcome, I'm so glad you're here. I felt a burst of happiness back. Thank you for your help in the past, I continued, and thank you for your attention tonight. I'm nervous about this and I hope it goes well. I got a sense of time swirling around like a vortex with the, focus, with the center focused on this evening. Then a feeling of patience mixed with a sense of excitement surrounded me. It felt like the all rune had been waiting for this for a long time. And now this was a possible moment a node of possibility. If I failed tonight, there would be another node in the future, but it might not occur for another hundred years. So, no pressure or anything. I kept breathing and feeling for peace. I'm sure the all rune meant well, but it had just made me even more nervous. Finally, my breath led me to a peaceful place. Like a cool drink of water on a warm summer day, I mentally savored it and then felt ready to get started. The first part of my plan was to gather as much information as possible, so I opened my eyes and turned towards Balaji. Okay, let's start with you. Look at NL's core and let me know what you see. The recorder was in the middle of the room and he was peering in my face. I decided to just ignore him. Balaji didn't even hesitate with his answer. 
Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to help you at all, Jason. I've been checking all the centaurs in the room, and I just can't see the cores you are talking about. My magic just doesn't do that well with detection. That's okay, I replied. I appreciate you trying. Amaya, can you sense anything? The recorder whipped his head dramatically in her direction. I'm not going to be much help either, she grimaced. Now I know what to look for. I can see that something should be there, but it's just a black hole to me. I can't see her magic or shell or anything you've described. It's just a void. The recorder whipped his head dramatically back to me. Thank you for that, I told her. Then I addressed the recorder. Okay, this is not going to work. You are pulling too much attention in the room, and I need to be able to focus. He drew himself up haughtily. I'm here for the council, and they have instructed me to be at the center of these proceedings. If what you say is true and you can succeed, then this will be a night we all want to remember for forever. If what you say is false, then we will see another mage fail, and that will also be instructional for those who are gullible. Gullible, I repeated. You are a young mage. You're practically human. For you to come to us sprouting theories and suggesting you can see something nobody else can makes me wonder what you are up to. What is your angle? What are you hoping to accomplish here? So you're here to uncover a con artist, I asked. My voice was starting to rise a bit. If that is what you are, I'll be very happy to record your performance and help unmask your scheme, he said smugly. Let me be clear, I stated. My voice was low and deadly. There is only one goal in this room, and it is to fix NL's core and have her continue to be a happy and healthy centaur. The energy of that intention needs to be the only thing in this room. Everyone is here for that purpose, except for you. I felt the all runes will join with me. I do not need to prove anything to you. You are hindrance to this evening, and as such, you are no longer welcome here. My voice had that weird echo it gets when I'm speaking with all runes power. I'm from the council, he raised his voice also. We will be represented. I have a right to be here. That is the failure of the council to pick you as their representative. Next time, they can pick a better person. You are not my responsibility. You will leave. I will not, he said menacingly, and you can't make me. I will find out what you are up to. I didn't have to deal with this clown, and neither did the all rune. I spared a quick look at the captain, but she just shook her head. I was pretty sure the recorder's authority overrode anything she could do. Fortunately, I knew an authority that overrode everyone in this room. I leaned forward and slapped my hand on the floor. By the power of the house, I said with a voice like God, you will leave this room and not return. Make me. The recorder stamped his foot on the ground, setting his jaw, which was why it was funny as hell when the floor disappeared beneath him and he got an oh shit look as he fell through. The floor snapped shut behind him and the whole room was silent as everyone stared at me in shock. Well, except for Sandy. She was already familiar with the all room doing, its, doing things much bigger than this. At that moment, there was a polite knock on the door. I didn't even say anything as the door opened on its own and a mage dressed in all black stepped inside. I think the house wanted me to be here, he said. It was the recorder from the Oval, the one that had been so helpful and supportive when we'd set some of the mages on fire. I was doing a piece on the dance and suddenly I was outside your door. Based on the fact that everyone is stuffed into this one room, I'm going to assume we are up to something and that a recorder would be useful. He was looking at the centaurs and Amaya when he saw Sandy and me. Ah, House Louisville, it is wonderful to see you again. It is wonderful to see you too, Sandy jumped in smoothly. I was still feeling a bit hot and bothered, so it's probably a good thing she took over. It just so happens we are in need of a recorder, and we'd love it if you'd stayed and helped us out. Of course, he said cheerfully. Can you give me a quick synopsis of what you're up to? I found it helpful to know helpful in knowing what to capture. Sure, Sandy nodded. The short version is we are attempting to repair NL's magic core, in the process allowing centaurs to become magical creatures again. Oh, his eyes got big. I heard a rumor about this. I just thought it was a hoax, though. There is no way this could be true. Nobody's been able to figure out what happened to centaurs, and the best of us have tried. 
Well, it's going to happen tonight, Amaya said firmly and gave me a wink. So who is the one who can sense the cores, he asked. I raised my hand. You certainly are an exciting fellow, aren't you, he mused. And who is the centaur who's getting their core repaired? Anel raised her hand. He gave her a deep bow. You are lovely, my dear, and I sincerely wish you all the best tonight. He turned back to me. Now don't let me keep you any longer. Just continue with what you had planned. I'll be recording and with any luck you won't even know I'm here. He paused in thought. Although I do find it odd that some that with something this big the council didn't have its own recorder here. They had one, but he had to drop out unexpectedly, Sandy deadpanned. The oh shit look at the centaur as he went through the floor popped into my mind and I burst out laughing. I tried to stop as this was a serious occasion, but Balaji joined in. Then the captain chuckled and soon we were all laughing hysterically. We tried to pause and get serious, but then someone would start snickering in an uproar with laughter again. I laughed so hard my side hurt. CL laughed so hard he snorted, which was funny as hell on its own. The laughter was just what we needed. It cleared the tension out of the air the way a summer rain clears out the heat. It was healing and bonding all at the same time. Finally, we took a quick break and I went to the restroom and grabbed a bite to eat. We'd only just gotten started, but the intermission reset the room and brought us all together to work again. Okay, Sandy, let me know. Okay, Sandy, let me know if you can sense anything with NL, I said as we started again. I can, she said confidently, but it's not with my mage powers, it's with John's ability. I can sense a strong sphere of earth magic in her, exactly where she says her magic core, where you say her magic core is located. Well, that was certainly interesting. It doesn't feel like dirt or stone, she continued. It feels woven somehow. Like it's a basket? She sounded tentative. Oh, wait. I had a gag gift once. It was this woven tube, tube where you would put your finger in either end, and when you tried to pull your finger out, it would tighten down so you couldn't escape. I think they were called finger traps. This feels something like that. This was great information. It looked like I needed to keep an eye out for some sort of weave or pattern as I took her core apart. You can see this better than anyone, Jason, so I think you should do, do your zoom in thing and really check it out, Sandy said. Maybe you'll see something else that will help you. I've been wanting to ask you, how are you planning on handling her magic? I know you want to take the core apart and fully restore her power, but if you do, her magic will just escape. I was planning on having her swear to me, I replied. When I was working with Annabeth, I had her swear both her power and her aura to me for a little while. It wasn't as easy as working with my own magic, of course, but it worked. Sandy nodded in understanding, but Amaya looked concerned. Jason, are you going to have her cede control of her magic to you? If so, you need to know that this almost never happens. She looked very serious. Mages swear on their own power, of course. This is the basis for the student-teacher relationship, as well as most agreements and contracts. When you directly try to control someone else's magic, however, it almost never goes well. Their magic will fight you for control, and it can fight quite hard. Plus, if you are successful, you'll need to handle two magic magics at the same time. That is very difficult to do. It sounds like you've had experience with this before, I asked. She nodded. I took over a friend's magic once when they were badly injured in an accident. It was a life or death situation and everything turned all right, out all right in the end, but it was extremely difficult. It was not something I would do again unless the situation was equally dire. I can certainly agree with you, I said. This fits the criteria, though. NL can't feel or control her own magic or aura, so someone will have to do it. This is a life or death situation as NL's core is starting to rupture. I've done this twice before, so I have some experience controlling someone else's magic. This is the only way I can see for NL to survive. Unless you have another suggestion? No, I don't, Amaya sighed. I've talked it over with Balaji blew with Balaji earlier today and neither one of us has any real ideas that could help. Does anyone have any ideas? Any other ideas they'd like to offer at this time? I looked around at everyone in the room. They shook their heads. It looked like this was all my responsibility, so I was going to continue the way I thought was best.
I sat on the floor and motioned for NL to sit beside me. I don't know how long this will take, so we might as well get comfortable. Hearing that, CL ran into my bedroom and came back with pillows and my bedspread. My bedspread. We stood back up and he, got, he made a comfortable little nest for us. We sat back down and I had to admit, it was a lot better. Thank you, CL, I said warmly. This certainly feels nicer. NL agreed and I got right down to business. We went over the swear together so she knew the words and felt as comfortable with them as possible. I know you can't feel your magic or your aura, but you just put as much intention into the words as possible, I said with confidence. Your magic and your aura belong to you, and they will do as you ask. I'm only here as a guide to teach your powers a new pattern. This swear is just asking them to pay their attention, pay attention, and do their best to learn. I got it. And Elle sounded much calmer than I would have been. Then she took a deep breath and began. I, Anna Lana Nula Nunu Lana Hana Hana, swear on my magic to grant full access to Jason Cole for the purpose of restoring my magic and my aura to their rightful place. He can see and use my magic like his magic, my body like his body, my aura like his aura. My power and my aura will assist him in every way possible to restore me to full health and power. He will have this ability until such time as I am in full control over my own aura and magic. I felt a click, and suddenly there wasn't a me and her anymore. Now there was an us. I put an arm around her and leaned into her as I kicked my sight into high gear, zooming into her core. I thought I could see everything clear, clearly before, but now she'd sworn to me I could see details that hadn't been there before. I zoomed into the surface of the core, looking for any sort of pattern like Sandy has suggested, but it just looked wrinkly and bumpy to me. I dipped below the surface and that's when I saw it. There was a direction to the compressed aura. I zoomed in even more and now I could see the individual threads that made it up. I panned to the right and suddenly the direction shifted 60 degrees or 90 degrees to the right. I panned some more and the direction shifted back again. I zoomed in even more until one thread of aura was as big as a pipe and then I followed it. Sure enough, the pipe eventually dipped to go below the other threads heading perpendicular to it. For sure, there was a weave. I would never have noticed this without Sandy telling me about it. I sank deeper into the shell. At first it was more, just more the same, hard threads running throughout. Then it started to look different. The threads weren't as hard anymore. The deeper I sank, the softer they become. Eventually I reached the surface of the magic they were holding in and the shell changed again. Right at the surface of the magic, the shell turned into real aura. It didn't have threads or anything like that. Instead it was smooth like a lotion. I, it was still compressed, of course, but it was the closest thing to a real aura that I had seen from her. I thought about it for a second and came up with a working theory. If I had to guess, the aura needed magic to be soft and actually act like aura. Magic was like water, moisturizing the aura. The surface... The aura near the surface was dry and hard, blocking all attempts at det detecting the magic inside. The threads had to be the key to keeping it all together. Just like the weave in a paper towel keeps it from falling apart when it gets wet, the weave of the shell was keeping it from falling apart as the magic tried to soak into it. It was very much like the finger trap Sandy had mentioned. NL's magic couldn't soak its way out because the weave slowed down the rate of absorption and kept the shell together. Without the weave, the shell would just get soggy and fall apart. So I needed to figure out how to destroy the weave while soaking the aura shell and her magic long enough for it to get nice and soft again. Once the aura was soft, it might snap back to existing in her body the way it was supposed to and that would fix her magic too. I had an idea, but first I needed to introduce myself. One of the best things I'd learned was that magic wanted to help, and it worked so much better if I asked it rather than just told it what to do. I spoke to her magic first. I expanded my awareness until I compassed all the magic in her core, including the magic in the hump. Greetings! I sent it images of welcome. I am Jason Cole. 
I am a mage. I sent images of my life now. I sent thoughts of my time with my housemates. I sent thoughts of T, the granny godmothers, Octa and her tangle. It seemed to really like that. I sent thoughts of Bermuda, snuggling, laughing, and being happy together. It seemed to like that too. I am your friend. I sent images of my time with CL and meeting with NL. I sent images of my fight to meet her and how the grove and the gem cells had healed her. That got a big reaction. Even inside its shell, the magic knew something had changed for the better. You are not at your optimal location. I didn't want to say her magic was wrong because it wasn't. Even packed in like this, it was still keeping her alive. However, it could be better and that's what I sent images of. I sent images of how her aura and magic should look inside her. That just got it very confused. So I sent images of other beings and how their aura, natural form, and magic all work together. I kept this up until her magic seemed to understand. I sent emotions too, freedom room to move, anticipation, hope. Then I realized I've been doing all the talking so far. As human beings, we don't want to change unless we feel fully heard. Maybe the same thing was true with magic? I'd heard the stolen magic's anger when it was in Big Ugly. What was NL saying to be now? So I calmed my thoughts and invited her magic to talk to me. At first it was quiet, and I thought I wouldn't get anywhere. Then it spoke up. It spoke of pressure. It spoke of growing but not knowing how. It communicated something like a splitting headache, only it went on and on and on. I didn't know any better and I couldn't see inside. It didn't know any better and it couldn't see outside the shell, so it just endured. It suffered and held out. I heard it and echoed it back to let it know I understood. That's when her magic really let loose. It spoke of years of pain. It was a migraine headache that never stopped. Layered over all that was loneliness. This magic had never talked to anyone else. Sometimes it had been able to sense that there was something else out there. There was more to this world than just pain and pressure, but it had never been able to do anything about it. I felt all that and I offered it friendship. If it would help me, it would never have to be lonely again. It would never have to be in pain again. That got a resounding yes from her magic. It was ready for a change. Next, I shifted my focus to her aura. I hadn't really talked to an aura before, but it was worth a shot. Come to find out, it felt exactly the same way. The interesting thing was, I heard nothing from the dried out portion. It was like it was dead, or sleeping. As the shell got softer, I gradually heard a tiny bit. It was only when it was very soft and right next to the magic that I heard about pressure and loneliness. I enrolled it in helping me as well, at least the part of it that was still aware. Hopefully I could dry, wake up the dried out part and it would follow along. It would just follow along. Now it was time to get this party started. The first little guys I invited to the party were just the people were just the people to bust stuff up. My miners. They had done a great job on the Rocky Golem in the park. Hopefully they could do an equally great job on the core's rocky exterior. I created the familiar feel figure in front of me. Blue overalls, miner's helmet with the light, and work boots. I added goggles, safety first, and then added a little patch that said, I heart an L. Might as well make this job personal. I added a jet back, a jet pack so he could get where he needed to go and also a duplicator ring. I also wanted a ring so he could change his size. I needed the hard dried chunks of her shell to be as small as possible. I was going to marinate them in her magic and a smaller chunk should get gooey a lot faster than a large chunk. For his weapon, I gave him a shiny pickaxe with a sharp point on one side and a flat scrawny part on the other side or scrapey part on the other side. I figured the point would be good with the hard surface and then he could flip it over and scrape the shell as it got softer. He still didn't seem ready yet. I normally use my manners to destroy something, but this was more of a rescue operation. I thought about it for a minute, then changed his blue overalls to a bright orange rescue outfit with a green reflective vest that said rescue in big bold letters on it. That was better. Finally, I added in a big mustache and gave him kind eyes. Rescuers are good people, and I wanted her and her aura to know we were on their side.
Then I went over him again and added in lots of little details. The more details that he had, the more magic he could hold. Once I was finished, I carefully filled him full of magic and turned him loose. He swung his pickaxe a few times, wiggled his mustache at me, then took off through the air with a happy wee. Then he flew off towards her core, trailing little puffs of smoke behind him. He was going to need energy to duplicate with, and I couldn't have him using NL's magic. She was going to need everything she had. So I talked to my main red gem cell and had him duplicate a new one just for working on her core. I used to give the miners walkie-talkie so I could talk to them, but I, didn't, but I hadn't needed that since I'd made my matrix. Now I could just talk to them directly. Use the gem cell and duplicate as many times as you need for your job, I told the miner. If you need more magic, just let me know and I'll fill the gem cell up again. What should I work on first, he said gruffly. I'm going to need to bring some of NL's magic to the surface of her core, so you can't make, just make a hole straight down. The magic is under pressure, so if you do that, it will just shoot out like a geezer. I'm thinking you need to make a basin to hold her magic, then make a small tunnel that circles around in a spiral that then goes down to her magic. The spiral should hopefully slow down the magic's rate of flow. Also angle the end of the tunnel so it aims down into the basin. It should fill up like a magic sink fills up with water. Got it? Aye aye sir, we'll make it happen. He raised his pickaxe in salute and got to work. I watched for a few minutes. But it looked like he had it in hand. He duplicated many times, then got to work digging. I realized I hadn't talked to him about keeping the chips of her core small, but seeing them work, I thought they were small enough. Now it was time to work on his companion, the Ass Blaster 2000. I love these little guys, and they normally did a great job eating rocks and shooting it far away in little pellets. Today, though, I needed something different. This time I made him fat, like a thick caterpillar. I made him a rescue orange too with big, with a big patch of green on his back with the word rescue in black. I gave him lots of little legs so he could move around on the ground and I gave him a jetpack too. After all, flying was fun and he needed to get to the core somehow. I gave him longer legs in the back so he could aim his back half and then a big tongue like a frog so he could lap up the hard aura chips. The idea was that he would pick up the aura chips, then marinate or chew them in the middle, then shoot the now soft aura, aura out of his back half like a big squishy fart. I decided to give him extra stomach muscles so he could move the aura along as it softened. Then I added goggles for safety, a mustache so he matched the miners, and finally a little tiny miner's hat just because it looked cute. I added the duplicator function and the size function to his goggles. I went over him in detail, filled him with magic, and turned him loose. He did not like the jetpack. Not at all. For some reason, it kept rolling him around in circles. I quickly removed it, and then I saw what the problem was. He already had his own method of propulsion. He just took a deep breath and then blasted the air out of his back end. It wasn't fast, but his little farts got him where he needed to go in a stately fashion. He landed beside the gem cell battery, duplicated several times, and then they all wandered over to the finished basin. The miners were now working on the spiral tunnel and they were almost done. I filled up the gem cell while I was waiting, and it wasn't long before the first of the miners came running out of the tunnel. The slower miners didn't make it out in time, and they were swept out with the first of NL's magic. The miners had done a bang up job, pun intended as her magic flowed out smoothly, splashing into the basin and gradually filling it up. The lead ass blaster stepped forward and used his thick tongue to start slurping up her magic. One of the, once the basin got to full, more of the ass blaster stepped into the edge and started filling up with her magic. The miners, meanwhile, had started in on the rest of the core surface and were breaking off tiny, tiny bits of hard aura. The lead ass blaster finished filling up with magic first and soon lapped up a whole lot of the loose aura chips. He swallowed them down into his first stomach and they started mar marinating in NL's magic. These outer chips were super hard and dry. They probably never touched magic before.
Now the procedure was in place, it was just a matter of working the process. The miners grew in number and swarmed all over her core, breaking it apart piece by piece. The Ass Blaster 2000s duplicated as well, sucking up her magic, sucking up chips, and starting marinating. It quickly became obvious we had a bottleneck at the basin, so the miners dug two more tunnels to her core. It also became obvious that it was going to take some time for those tough chips to soften, so the ass blasters that were full started lifting off the surface of the core to make room for newer ass blasters. As the process continued, her core started looking like one of those mining colonies you see on space shows. It was fascinating and neat, but I never lost sight of the fact that I was working with NL's life. I refilled the gem cells several times and I kept an eye on the first ass blasters. The chips were absorbing the magic and in the process they were expanding. He now had three stomachs full of aura with two more still to go. The miners got through the hardest layer and now the work started going faster. These layers were easier to mine, easier to meet, eat, and didn't take as much marinating time. I still didn't have any chips finished yet, and I had a sneaky suspicion that all the ass blasters were going to get ready about the same time. As I watched, the miners broke into the really soft layers. Her magic was soon going to be free. I'm working on your new home and it's not ready yet, I sent out to her magic. In a few minutes, I'm going, you're going to feel the pressure going away. I'm asked, I'd ask that you just hang on for a few minutes more and don't expand yet. I need to get your aura ready first. I got back a little grumbling and impatience, but mostly excitement and hope. So far, so good. It seemed like suddenly everything happened at once. The miners broke through a section of fibers and the shell just fell apart. It was like a balloon made of wet paper and suddenly her magic was loose. It roared like a dam had burst and started to explode, started to explode in all directions. Stop! I clamped my will down hard to contain the explosion. Stay right where you are. This was not the time to be nice. I was not going to have her magic fly right out of her body and get lost in the room. Per her oath, her magic was like my magic and it obeyed me. Her magic churned and rolled, but it held its position. I just got under control when the lead ass blaster let me know it was time. Ready or not, Operation Aura Splat was getting ready to happen. He cocked ass, aimed right toward, aimed towards her right shoulder, and let loose. It was the wettest, fartingest sound I'd ever heard. It was looked totally gross, but the result was awesome. A tiny piece of aura shot out, looking like a wet string of snot, but as it moved it extended. By the time it reached the edge of her body, it was big and misty like a cloud. This was perfect. Ass blasters. Aim toward any open part of her body and fire at will. If you don't see an open spot, move around until you do. Good luck. Pew! 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 The Ass Blaster 2000 Rescue Brigade got to work. Soon there were little aura clouds everywhere. The miners kept working on the chunks of core left and soon it was completely broken down. When that happened, I had them fly back to Penny. She thanked them on my behalf and absorbed them into, back into my magic and soul, recycling at its finest. It also occurred to me that now NL was going to have her own aura and magic in her body. It probably wasn't a good idea to leave the Ents and the gem cell batteries in her either. The last thing I wanted was for her to get contaminated with my magic. Hopefully all this worked, hopefully all this worked, and she could heal herself if needed. So I gave the order and the Ents picked up the gem cells and headed over to Penny as well. The ass blasters were doing a great job, but the aura clouds were being a real pain. Instead of being fused into one large cloud on her physical surface, which was what I needed, they just wandered around and bumped into each other. It was chaos, and I finally had to expand my awareness to her whole body and give my introduction speech again. More of her aura got the idea this time, but there was still a huge number of clouds that just wandered around clueless. I took a deep breath and accepted the fact that a bunch of this aura had never been active before, so I had no idea what was going on. It was like I was dealing with a bunch of new baby ducks with no clue of the world around them. That gave me an idea. Baby ducks imprinted on their mama. Maybe I could get them to do the same with me. 
if you feel lost, I called. Look at me. All those little lost aura clouds froze, and suddenly I felt all their attention directed at me. I am your papa. Welcome. I sent love. I sent hope. I also sent a good dose, a good dose of do as I say parental authority. It seemed to work. The aura was still a mess. It was thick in some places and had holes in others. At least it was paying attention to me now. It was like icing a... I found out the thing that worked best was to just rub my hand over NL and smooth it out. It was like icing a cake. I filled in the holes and made sure it wasn't bunched up too thick. I only had so much aura after all. Her body was easy, but all that aura needed to go down her legs and arms too. The Ass Blaster 2000s followed me along and kept shooting out new aura clouds as they were ready. I rubbed that poor girl everywhere. Her arms, her belly, her legs, her armpits. Her magic tried to make another break for freedom, but I shut it down again, one step at a time, and right now I needed to keep icing her aura cake. Finally, the last ass blaster shot its final wet fart, and I smoothed it into position. I expected to feel something, but I didn't. I checked, and all the ass blasters were empty and tooting their way back to Penny. I scanned her aura again, checking for anything I'd missed. The last ass blaster was absorbed, and when I finally found it, or the last ass, ass blaster was absorbed when I finally found it, I hadn't done the bottoms of her feet. When I finished that, I felt the click, and the aura fused into one piece. Hallelujah. Part one was done. Now her aura container was in the right place, it was time to release her magic. I felt the all rune watching over us. It had been here the whole time, but now I really felt its focus. This was the big moment. It is time. I used my best wise Gandalf voice, but the magic didn't really care. It just exploded. All that pent up compression released and the magic expanded and went everywhere. Most of it stayed at the spiritual level and filled up her aura. Some of it shifted to the physical side and absorbed into her body. Her muscles, blood, organs, and bones inhaled the magic. Everything was in balance. Everything was okay. I breathed a sigh of relief as I felt the all rune crow with satisfaction. It is done. The curse is broken. I felt a snap and a ripple of something fell off of her. It fell off the other centaur llamas in the room too. The all room felt delighted. Then I felt NL's heart stutter. What? That didn't happen. I must have imagined it. Her heart stuttered again. Then everything seemed to fall apart at once. Her lungs started shuddering. Her organs started failing. Her muscles went limp and she fell in a heap on the floor. What the fuck? The magic, it had to be the magic. That was the only thing that had changed. I zoomed into her heart and saw the awful truth. Her heart that had worked its thing without magic, any magic at all, was rejecting her own power. No, that wasn't quite right. It had happily absorbed her magic, knowing on a cellular level it was the right thing to do, but now I didn't know what to do with it. It was trying to push her magic back out and her magic wasn't going. Her body was fighting itself and there was only one loser. After all this, NL was going to die. And that's the end of the chapter. So I expect you will be looking forward to next week with great anticipation. Have a lovely week.